don't you just love this lovely tourist site, tourist attraction? Yes, indeed, it is at 27 degrees here in Abuja. The weather is pretty calm, and so you could uh, do what you will while you can. So that's why we bring you this, this Friday morning, when you just uh, take it all in. For a lot of people, it's half day at work. But for others, it's different strokes, actually, for different strokes, but... That's the narrative. Just try to make you ease yourself into this day today. Usuma Dam. Hmm. One of the most beautiful places I've seen recently. Lovely view there, Usuma Dam, uh, in nation's capital. Lovely Friday morning to every one of you. And like Chamberlain said, we're taking it easy this Friday morning, uh, taking in all the calmness and trying to relax in the, in the light of everything that's going on in the country. So, yes, welcome to Sunrise <laughs> Daily. <laughs> Well, no doubt, it's a, it's a very lovely sight to behold. Honestly, guys, again, I say that. I mean, just imagine Chamberlain and Kayla that this was the location where they shot Wakanda, the Black Panther. Isn't it, isn't it possible? Of course not. But when I see these sites, guys, I always see a movie site. And well, good morning and welcome to the program. Yes, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Sunrise City. So, yeah, so quite a number of things I will focus on here today, but um, uh, and you get to see them in the daily. So, for a lot are happening today, um, I know that the ministerial briefing continues here in Abuja today, where they will wait, guys. Wait, wait, wait. Do we expect anyone to go and say, actually, I've not done? not perform as I ought to, or give themselves a thumbs down. Well, I guess it will be up to you to decide once they reel out all that they have done. But uh, lots of highlights on the front pages, and as it has always been, where we bring you some of those narratives in terms of the cost of living. That will be a conversation for I don't know how long. I mean, the briefing is an opportunity for the ministers to highlight what it is that they have done. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is a different kind of cabinet. Um, President Tinubu at the beginning had said, I can sack you if you do not deliver. So they have KPIs. And we're supposed to be on the lookout for those KPIs to ensure that they actually meet up with what it is that they are set to do. If they have not performed well, we should also scream and say, this person hasn't done well. And the briefings, you know, of course, like Chamberlain said, everyone is going to come out and say, oh, this is what we have achieved. This is what we have achieved. But it now behoves on us, especially us in the media, to go back and check what it is that they are supposed to achieve mm. and see how much they've done and what's lacking. What do you think, Ayo? Mm. I think what would be nice, guys, is to put out a poll for the federal government to put out a poll and say, Absolutely. rate your ministers. <laughs> well, one, rate the your National ministers, Ass yes. Yeah, the National Assembly is one. Um, the People's Assembly is another, even though the National Assembly is supposed to be a representation of the people. Most of the ministers, at least almost all of them, except the minister of the FCT. Supposed to be? Has, well, yes, because almost all of them have to go to every part of Nigeria, except the FCT minister, of course. Who is whose responsibility and jurisdiction is within the FCT. Every one of them has to fulfill one responsibility or the other in most parts of the country. So it'll be good, really, to find out. Plus, these ministers, ha they are representing one state or one region or the other. It'll be good to even check it out. For instance, a number of people will be asking, complex as the power sector is, um, what's your rating of the Minister of, the, of, uh, of, of Power? And, you know, just let the count go. Minister of Water Resources, Minister of the Blue Economy and all of that. So it'll be good, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Plus, Jimbaline, going back to what you said, what are their KPIs? In, are it's known it's baby steps. Let's yeah. start with the accountability <laughs> mechanism that comes from the people. The people behave badly all over the world, right? People, you know, do not deliver their responsibilities all over the world. But what makes people do the right thing is if they know that the accountability mechanism is in place. And the accountability mechanism in this case has to be the people. But well, what's that, what are their KPIs? I think the reason why uh, you may think that this is the government that is different, as you said, is because the last government didn't change ministers that much. 
The previous ones are they don't even need to announce it. They just it just happens. They switch. They change. So we'll be looking to see what happens. And uh, well, we have to heal Nigeria, don't we? Um, yeah. I think I might like that old national anthem, which the national <laughs> assembly is trying to get us back to. Uh, dear. And, well, uh, the only thing, the only issue that I have. Record time too. First, well, yeah, but third reading. Wow. <laughs> the only thing, okay. the only issue so, that I have. With so let's that see. One. Um, today. Yeah. For the happening today, do we have that? All right, uh, if not, let's go ahead and take you through some of the dailies this morning. All right, let's go ahead and take you through some of the dailies this morning. I will start off with Blueprints newspaper. Sanusi Lamido makes history, returns at 16th Emir of Kano. Look at the riders. Governor Yusuf orders Bayero brothers, three others, to vacate palaces in 48 hours. Northern elders, residents differ. So that's the big one you see right there on the front page of Blueprint newspaper. New Telegraph, after four years in exile, Kano governor reinstates Emi Asanusi as state assembly sacks Bayero others. That's their own big day. Five dethroned emirs to vacate thrones in 48 hours. Northern elders express concern. So, similar narrative right there. So, uh, that's what you see. But beneath this list, story, poverty, hunger, driving crimes as low as 500 naira in Nigeria. That's described to the Sultan. So, you know what to have a look. Nigerian Tribune follows in the same light. Kano awaits Emi Asanusi as government deposes Bayero others. That's also what you see here this morning on the front page of the paper here today. And then take a look at Daily Trust. Sanusi returns as Emir of Kano. Bichi, Rano, Karaye, Gaia, Monarchs dethroned. Development, bad omen, ascribed to Northern Elders. Dan Agundi challenges action in court. So there you go, all of those on the front page here this morning. And then on to some business narratives. Daily Independence starts that one. FG lists oil sector achievements, targets $20 billion investments this year. Right after that, you see Nigerian News Direct. Despite total energy snob, oil minister anticipates over $16 billion investments into Nigeria. So, and then um, you also get to see uh, Business Day. Nigerians' healthcare woes worsen as states struggle to tap 128 billion naira fund. That's uh, our Business Day reports this morning. The Guardian also following through with this. One year of renewed hope on the front page here. Tunubu's costly reforms leave Nigerians on edge one year after. That's uh, how the Guardian reports today. The Nigerian Observer, Nigeria's life expectancy rises to 56.2 years, highest in Cross River, Ekiti, Ogun. So that's uh, what you see some of those front pages this morning. A number of things stand out uh, there, so let me, I'm going to, I mean, if you look at what the Sultan is saying, that the hunger is driving people to commit crimes, and he tagged it as low as 500 naira. So, uh, if that is not scary to you, I don't know what will be. So, it's, um, yeah, they may give all the um, scorecard as much as they want, but there's a stark reality that stares us in the face. So policies on the one hand, implementation appears to be key here. So how they run with all of that is a big challenge. So um, it's something that, um, yes, quite a number of us have broken some of these things that will get more people to break it down. And I reckon that they get this feedback. There's no way they won't get There's it. There's no way they can live without that. I mean, look at this headline from The Guardian today. 
very important headline. Mm. Chinubu's costly reforms leave Nigerians on edge one year after. Reforms, yes, but costly. And how long can we hold on for? You know, when we talk about the economy, people forget that it is tied to security as well. Yeah. And like the Sultan was saying, 500 Naira can buy someone getting into crime. Someone, well, yeah, someone can do crime for beer. For yeah. a drink, they will commit a crime in mm -hmm. this country. For food, people will commit crimes in this country. That is a dangerous dynamic. Are we going to be able to park our cars on the street in a few years' yeah. time? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been parking mine for some years now. Well, in a few years, in <laughs> five I, years, Chamberlain. I expect to keep parking it. Because at some point, you know, there's a way this dynamic works. And if, if, if people who are sociologists right now will be able to understand what I mean. Yeah. It moves from hating government to hating anyone that looks like government. So well, you seem, you look like the problem when you have a car. You look like a problem if you're dressed well. Is it, 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 could, it could metastasize to that level. What's being done to ensure that things don't get there? Well, um, there are two ways to it. So the thing is, I mean, and in fairness to the Sultan, he's been talking about this for a long time, right from, even when the former government was there, he kept on hopping on the security situation, how we're not doing the kind of things we ought to be doing. He called several meetings. It was a different fora. He spoke directly so the president at the time could hear. And your guess is as good as mine in terms of the kind of results that we had at the end of the day. So he seems to be continuing that trajectory, trying to point out some of these things. But there are several moving parts to all of these things. That's why we keep talking about the states, the states, the state governments. There's a lot that needs to change in the way the states conduct their businesses. The National Social Register, um, they did say they were going to come up with their own such that they can reach people who need this, at least the, at the lowest rung of the ladder. They said this Has before. that happened? <laughs> They've said this before. So has <laughs> it happened? <laughs> what data before. do we have? Because you, you, you can't plan without data. Data, exactly. So no matter how much palliatives... You and quote, real unquote, data, not fictitious data. So yeah. those are some of the real challenges that, f that stare us in the face. So that's the first challenge. If you don't have... How do you reach people? If the data you have is political data, you will always have real problems because the people who really don't get it, if you keep giving to political cronies, there's only a limit to which you think you can achieve some of this. And it's, it's more dangerous if you can't get the real pulse of the people. Yeah. Your political cronies will tell you what you want to hear. You can't get the real stuff. So if it's either we'll sit up and ensure, look, how do we drill this down? If they don't have to like you to tell you the truth. Oh, yes. that, that's the way it Absolutely. is. Data, you can politicize data because you if you do, you that's what you that. get. So, I mean, let, let's also look at this headline. I know you mentioned it uh, at the time when we were talking with Ayo, um, the uh, from the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper, mm -hmm. National Assembly uh, passes bill to return to first national anthem. More on that from page six. Nigeria, of, we held you. Of the uh, Daily Trust newspaper. I really want to get how people feel about the old national anthem, I, I think it's important that people don't mix it up. We're not talking about the second stanza of the first national anthem. We're talking about the old national anthem, the uh, Nigeria we hail the, uh -huh, that one. How do you feel about it? Is, this, is, that, is that something that you would want? <laughs> the National Assembly seems to be in a haste At this point, to get this done. I don't know if it matters what they want now. <laughs> right, but the, they the are speed. the representatives of the people. Of so maybe they are speaking the voices of the people, but maybe. The speed with which they're going about it suggests that it's a foregone conclusion. So um, quite interesting. Interesting. But at definitely. the end of the day, of course it has to be about the people. People will always, you always have to say what you think about this thing because it's your country. It is your country, so you have a voice, you should have a stake. So um, that's where it is. Yeah, talk to us about it. What do you think? Should we, do you, do you agree? Do you, do you know the old national anthem? Do you know it? And does well, it no, represent? No, don't forget the reason why they're The reason changes. why they're changing, exactly. Because, you know, the idea of a national anthem is that it's supposed to reflect the people and the times that they're in. Mm -hmm. So, yes, national anthems can change depending on what's changed about the people. Mm -hmm. Some people are questioning the, the history of the past um, national anthem. Part of the word is, is what they were hopping on because it's going to foster unity, for oh, us yeah. to move together. But there are several building blocks. There are several things that they need to change to ensure that this 
that they want to achieve comes to fruition. I would have said I'll plead the fifth on talking about the national anthem because hey, even the one, the old, both the old one, there was a way that every, you just had to know it because it played every day on TV. You know, every day you had to listen to it. Every day you played it and you had to sing it in the schools. I don't know whether or not that is still happening now. And that can be reflected in the times when we've asked officials of government to recite the national anthem, the national pledge, or even sing the national anthem. What have we gotten on to, up until now about that? So that is one thing. On the other hand, is okay. One was done by a colonial master, another one was done by Nigerians, pulling from poems of more than 50 Nigerians who came up with it. So I hope all of that consideration, all of that conversation is ongoing, particular concerning that particular matter. The one that interests me, guys, is what you have on the front page of a number of dailies, but particularly on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune this morning, which said, says that the Senate is revisiting Jonathan's report probe of 11,866 abandoned projects. And a few of them are listed on the front page. Uh, the National Library, Lagos, Dagri Road, Abuja Housing Project, Calabar Power Plant, others on lists, says Ajahuta alone gulped over $10 billion. Uh, that's as, as um, worthy as that is, as worthy of celebration, or worthy of mention and worthy of applauding as that is let's not forget that this is not new this conversation and i think we've talked about it even on this program one or two times within the past one or two weeks and that's the fact that it is not the only one it's not it's actually more than eleven thousand eight hundred eight hundred and sixty six. as of february this year the house of representatives urged the federal government to revisit over sixty thousand abandoned projects that report was made known to the federal government by a member of the House uh, representing some parts of Ogun State, Joseph Adibeson, who said available statistics have shown that over 60,000 projects are abandoned in Nigeria, thereby obstructing citizens from utilizing their tax proceeds and natural resources with the total value of these projects reaching trillions of Naira. So, 11,866 projects is what the senate is talking about the house of representatives has cited sixty thousand of such all over nigeria so i guess there are a lot more questions to be asked the jonathan administration probed it or rather you know researched it and found out that we have such the buhari administration it was even i think it was the office of the vice president that made that known the uh, chartered institute of project managers have also cited that we have them in thousands just like that so on the one hand, we applaud what the Senate is talking about, but maybe there is more. Who is going to be asking the questions? That's my take this morning, generally. Well, in the meantime, let's uh, take a short break. When we return, it's time for us to take on the issues as they come. Please stay with us. Ample use of Kano stage is taking a significant step in the Kano state traditional landscape. The governor, in the company of his deputy, the speaker of the state assembly, and other principal officers in the government, signed into law the Kano state Emirates Council Amendment Bill. He subsequently announced the 14th Emir of Kano, His Royal Highness Al Haji Sunu Sulaimi II, as the Emir of Kano. By the provisions of the Kano State Chiefs and Emir's appointment and this deposition law 1984 and the Kano State Emirate Council Refill Law 2024, with full support of the Kingmakers. I have approved the reappointment 
kwa kumala sunubi Popularly known as Muhammad Sunnusi the second as the new area of Kabul. Earlier, the State House of Assembly dissolved all four newly created Emirate Councils. The dissolution of the affected Emirates is sequel to deliberations on the floor of the House during plenary. The bill receives accelerated passage from the lawmakers. <laughs> This decision marks a significant shift in Kano State's traditional leadership structure, reinstating the historical prominence of the Kano Emirate under the leadership of Emir Sunusi II. Sadiq Eliasu, Channel's Television News. All right, welcome back. Yes, indeed, that is what we're going to be talking about this morning. We've got Abdul Adam Fage here with us. He's a legal practitioner. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, we also do have uh, Usman Imam, who is also a legal practitioner and lecturer at Yusuf Metama Sula University, who joins us from our studios in Kano. Uh, welcome Good morning. to him. Uh, good morning. Good Thank morning. you for joining us as well today on the program. So, gentlemen, uh, let's get to it. So, this back and okay. forth. Today happens to be uh, a significant day. Uh, we'll talk about why. But let me start with you, uh, Mr. Fage. I, yes, we understand uh, as reported why did that. There are mixed reactions to this, uh, but we've seen the backstory at back end. After the National the State Assembly passed a law, the governor signed it, and maybe as some people say, the rest is history. What's your imp impression of this? Well, thank you, Bios. Good morning, all. You see, the impression is, in fact, when I learned day before yesterday that the state assembly even made the first reading and they concluded everything and the next day they concluded all the second and third reading and fuck that bill. It baffles me. It baffles me in the sense that you see you cannot just go and fast law, especially the throning the MS, without any allegation leveled against them that they did this, they did that, they committed something to them or the, the, as they perceive, which is worthy of been serving them with even allegations so that they will respond, so that when they fail to, maybe all these machineries will be put in place. As for me, I had no of that, but I don't know you as the media. There was no any report that this AMS do certain thing or did certain thing or committed something which is what they have been querying them and there was no any query placed before them they just mobilized the members of the set house of assembly the first law less than 48 hours is 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 in fact it's torturing and disturbing but have they done anything wrong by passing this law and going about it like this well, actually, if we if you look at Section Four of the 1999 Constitution as amended, it's clear the State House of Assemblies. In fact, that section created the legislature. They have power under that section to make law. Also, I mean, I refer all laws. It's within their competence. I'm not doubting that. But what ignited them? What you cannot just wake up and say, let me make law. No, law are made for good governance. That's the central of making law. I think I, think I need to clarify on that because what, what, he, what we're trying to find out is, do they need a reason to remove the emirs? Was there, because that's what you're saying, oh, they just passed the law, they, were, they didn't accuse them of anything. Does the law say that they have to accuse them of something before they are removed? You know, they are, the, 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 the emir or the emirs, or all the other staff, mm. all the other appointees are creation of the law because they are made through the instrument of the law. So if you want the throne or if you want to remove any person in Nigeria, especially even though that such um, law, uh, 2023 law of Kano said they refill it as well, which fell out all the procedures before you the throne. Emirs, or before you remove any person appointed by Emir. 
So they were clever by her, not knowing that there is a rule of natural justice which is invested under Section 36 of the 1999 Constitution. You cannot just go ahead and remove any appointee without giving him notice, without serving him with duty, even though they repeal that law of Colonel State. So we have ground now in the Constitution. We have before dethroning any emir in Nigeria. So that's the point they miss in right. doing that. Usman Iman, let's bring you in here. He just fell short of saying, look, there may be lawmakers, but this is a tad dictatorial in the way they've gone about it. So, assalamu alaikum once again. I remain Barista Usman Imam Tidun Wuzulti. As my learned uh, friend has uh, said, uh, there is no contention why uh, the four new emirs will be removed. But initially, Nigeria is a constitutional, uh, we are a Republican constitution, I mean. So under Republican constitution, if you look at the law that was passed during Ganduja administration, it's totally illegal and unconstitutional. Yes, why I say it's illegal, unconstitutional, and it's 100% defective, because under constitutional uh, system, where the country becomes uh, Republican Constitution, uh, Professor Ben Umwobozi has uh, argued on different literature that you cannot have a law that will bring the divisions among the citizens. So if you look at the Ganduja's law that has been uh, repealed within those days, it has a kind of uh, brought the division of the citizens. There are uh, those that are entitled with the, what do you call it, hereditary rights, and there are those that are not. You see, if you look at the, uh, some sections of the law, the, 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 laws, uh, the sections articulate that the descendant of, let's say, Bichi, a descendant of the uh, second Kano Dabo, one of the second of the Plani Emirs, then will be uh, the, the Emir there in case of any uh, vacancy. Then in Kano Emirate, the descendant of uh, the same uh, second Kano Dabo of blessed memory will be a kind of will be appointed if there is any vacancy. So if you look at the constitutional uh, prohibition under section uh, 42, that's what it says. I think I can quote the law clearly, which it says, uh, no citizen of Nigeria shall be subjected to any disability or deprivation merely by reason of, his, uh, of the circumstances of his birth. So if you look at it, the, 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 the law that was passed during Ganduje contradicts the constitution 100%. This is a fundamental human right, issue of discrimination. And you know, the issue of discrimination does not emanate from Nigerian constitution. It emanates from African charter. And it also, if you go to European convention, article three. So there are so many uh, prohibitions of written law that this uh, law, which has been revealed, has contradicted. So to me, the repeal is in order. And whatever comes under it is the constitutional provision that the State Assembly exercises under Section 100 of the 1999 Constitution as amended. It empowers them to make laws under Section 4, as my learned uh, colleague has mentioned. So if you look at it, there is nothing wrong, even if they have not committed any offense, but the law, you see, they have been removed uh, removed by circumstances is only by the circumstances not by any uh, allegation there is no any allegation that is why the emirs were given uh, uh 20 48 hours to vacate from the policies uh, so if there is any offense they they, they have committed the the, the, the the direction is going to be different so for that there is no any illegality uh, in this uh, amendment, the amendment to me as a lawyer, as a constitutional lawyer, particularly on, when it comes to the issue of human rights, particularly the issue of discrimination, I think the amendment is in order. Thank you so much uh, for clarifying that, uh, Mr. Osman. But I want to come back to Mr. Fage because, you know, he, he, he touched on something right now, which is the stool of the emir. At the time when these um, four emirates were added to the Kano emirate, making them five emirates, yeah. The, one of the issues that many Nigerians had, even in Kano, even Kanawa, they were all talking about this, was that it had reduced the authority 
of the seat of the emir, a revered seat. And that's something that he's alluded to. What did you make of that? And do you think that with everything that's going on now, is there a possibility that that authority and reverence that comes with the seat of the emir would return? Of course, there's a conversation going on right now about the economies that were created around these four extra institutions and what's going to happen to all of those people. We'll get to that shortly. But the seat of the emir, does what has happened now, in your view, bring back any sort of reverence that was uh, you know, accrued to that seat of the emir? You see, the seat of emir, the seat of oba, the seat of obi, all these seeds are revered and exalted. There is no doubt about it. And I see no harm. And in fact, almost across the Nigeria, there, we have so many emirs in one state, you, in Kasina, in Jigawa, even in, north, in South, South, and South East. So many states with emirs, not only single emir. So there is no harm in that. That reverence, as you are talking about, and the exalted seed of the emir, once you are serving your people, whether it's one emir or two emir, there are some demarcation, like in Kano now. The emir of Bichi has about 13 to 14 local government under him, so also the other emirs. And in fact, during the Ganduji administration, each emirate council, they went and constructed mosques, a third road, hospitals. In fact, so many infrastructures. Mm -hmm were put in place for the betterment of the people of that area. And that is why Abnisho said the laws are made for good governance. So in your view, sharing the adding four emirates didn't reduce the authority of the seat yeah. of the emir. Let me ask Mr. Usman about the economy, <clears throat> the economies that were created around these four extra emirates, because that is one of the contentions right now. Places uh, like... Uh, you know, the places where is the Bichi, Rano, Karae, Gaya, all these places that had the Emirates, of course, it gave people jobs. It created economies around those places. Now, with the passage of this uh, bill that has happened right now, what happens to those mini economies that were created around those uh, four extra Emirates and the people that benefited? So, new to me, whether there is a crime, I know there is. Yes, it's very unfortunate. That is why whenever our politicians are going to exercise their constitutional power, let them exercise it accordingly. That power should not be abused. Now look at it. Some people are going to be a little bit victims. But I know the governor is very kind. Those that have been engaged in uh, emirate services are going to be returned because the local governments there exist. So if you look at it, you cannot build anything, uh, you cannot build something on nothing. So the law that has brought them very unfortunately does not stand. So if you look at it constitutionally, whatever advantages we have is immaterial as far as the law is defective. So it's very unfortunate, but I know with the, uh, because government must have a kind of uh, plan B to see that the situation is uh, going to be remedied. So I hope the governor is going to uh, uh, at least encourage the economic activities so that people are not going to be rendered uh, useless and unemployed. So I hope this is going to be done. But the law, as far as I, con as I am concerned, uh, is in order. That is my bond of contention. I want to, I want to get your thoughts on, on you know, there's a, there's a court uh, that's granted an order that is halting Sanusi's reinstatement. Are you aware of this? And what do you yes, make I'm of aware. that? So, you know, actually, it has been very unfortunate why judicial powers have been abused. In Nigeria, no, each and every person knows that our court behave as if they are not independent. Or I think like there is no sanctity of uh, uh, judiciary, which is ought to be. So whether the order has been granted or is not uh, granted, what the order is saying is, is an, an uh, ex-party order that will restrain. But fortunately, 
the act has been completed. So now, what are you going to restrain? So the order cannot affect the entire process because it's supposed to be issued or granted before the state assembly started their uh, programs. And okay. is their constitutional right? We have mentioned section four, and we have I have mentioned section. Uh, uh, let me mention section uh, ninety and sec uh, down to section uh, one hundred of the constitution. So if you look at it, they have powers to make laws. As far as the laws are not illegal, immoral. So, Mr. Man, are you then yes. saying that notwithstanding the order obtained from the Kano State High Court, preventing them from enforcing the law that was repealed, that law should not and cannot be obeyed? I, what, what I'm saying, the order does not have any conse direct consequence with the law. Because the law has been passed before the order was issued. And when we are talking about ex parte, ex parte, you issue ex parte in order to prevent a harm. When you think there is harm, harm. But in this situation, there is no even harm. No, but the, Nigerian the, the order is not to stop them from making the law. The order is to stop them from enforcing that particular law pending the determination of that matter. So how are you, go how are you going to, st uh, st to stop a governor that enjoys constitutional uh, backing to make, uh, to sign on, the, on, on, the, on, on any bill that uh, has been brought before him? Or so, how are you going to, there is an order. So that tell us then, I mean, as a law lecturer, are you then, yeah. what, is this law not enforceable? It's not. Categorically, it's not. It's, so not, it's even an abuse. Because when you are talking about, yeah, when you are talking about fundamental human rights, there is breach. Who's right? has been breached in this situation. Mm. Do right. not agree that constitutionally is the state assembly that has been given a uh, mandate constitutionally to make uh, laws? And do we not agree constitutionally that is the state government that will uh, uh, implement the law? So who, or whom are you going to stop? No, they actually situation. restrain the IGP, the state government, and all their agents. I, IGP, can, IG, IG, all IGP cannot engage his uh, office and his, uh, his uh, people or officers into this uh, okay. issue because he knows something has gone wrong. Categorically, I'm, I'm telling you, constitutionally, we know the responsibility of uh, uh, as a legislator. It's the bad law. We know that is the, 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 the responsibility of a uh, uh, state governor or executive. It's just to uh, implement the law. We know judicial is in, in, implement uh, to interpret the law. All right. Do you understand? Let's... But in Nigerian court, you know the interpretation is what matters. It's politically interpreted. Mm. Let me, yeah. Okay, let's hear right. from Mr. Fage. What do you think of this? Well, in fact, even can be seen from my face. It is unfortunate and it baffles me. You know, initially before even this response, he said the law that was made during Ganduja's administration was illegal and unconstitutional. It doesn't lie in a lawyer or even a judge not sitting as a judicial officer in court to pronounce what has been done as illegal and unconstitutional. It's for the court to make that pronouncement. But look at what we are seeing this morning. That's number one. Then for the order, the order is not saying they should not pass the law state assembly or the governor should not assent that law. Already, as he rightly pointed out, the law has been passed and the governor beautifully assented it yesterday. But that order of yesterday or day before yesterday was saying they should not give effect, they should not implement that law. You see, once ago, uh, the Emir is enthroned, there is, oh, uh, that's, is it officer staff, that uh, staff, staff of office, there is instrument that will be issued to him, confirming that you are indeed now the 16th Emir of Kano State. All these have not been done. It may be, it may be done today or tomorrow or Monday. So already the court now handed down decision, you should not do that. There is no one on earth that will not comply with that order. We are in a democratic society guided by constitution, by act, and laws of state, and other enabling statutes. So I don't think, even if the law lecturer said, you, you know, and all the viewers know this cannot be done. The governor I know is a law-abiding person. He will 
Kwang Fly, I know he will come fly with this order. Let the mat because I from the order I see is a fundamental right and possible, and the African is one of the appointees is uh, with one of the first class appointees in Kano said Aminu Babad Aguni. In fact, in respect of even the law, you know the law that they passed yesterday and was assented. I was I even I was surprised because they said they refilled 2019. 2020 and 2023 laws. And when you refill laws, all these laws were annulled. We are no longer in being all the laws. So in essence, yesterday when that law after it has been passed was assented, in Kano there was no Emirate Council law. And in the absence of any law, with the exception of all, only this paragraph that dissolved the Hyped Emirate Council and now bring back the Emir of Kano. There was no any law. If you dissolve all the law, if you annul all the laws, so under what law? Because they have not enacted any other law. Under what well, law? You know, even all, all of these considerations, Mr. Fagi, um, if you can hear me, one of all of this convers uh, con you know, conversation we're having is all, it, it has certain origins that I'm not sure what you guys think. You are both lawyers, so you can speak to that. So on the one hand is the legal perspective, and I think it was Mr. Usman in our Kano studio who uh, cited the political, um, con the co political considerations and implications of this. Uh, do you want to speak to that, you know, for a little bit, uh, Mr. Usman in our Puja studio? What are these political considerations that you talk about? Uh, beg your pardon, sorry, I, I'm in our Kano studio, in the, in the Kano studio. What are these political considerations that you cited earlier that you think need to be given attention? Because, of course, there are those who believe that the throwing in the, or removing the emir from the throne at the time was all political. How do we insulate the traditional seats from such political influences? I cannot. Mm. Mm. Can you hear me, Mr. Usman? All right, well, maybe he cannot hear me. Mr. Fage, maybe I should ask you, I take that question to you then in our Abuja studio. How do you think we can insulate our traditional seats? You mentioned the fact that these seats are sacrosanct and should be given their dues. But then political politicians from time to time will come and do whatever it is that they, they, need, they feel that they need to do, just in, as in the case of uh, the removal of the Emir of Kano at the time. How do we insulate, what gives them that right and how do we insulate the seats from such influences? You see, as for me, apart from being a lawyer, I'm also a politician. But when this politician uh, taking this revered and exalted office to this disdain, you know, it's unfortunate. Me, I'm not in support of all this that has been doing right from the former administration and this administration. Because this institution, even the politician came and met it. This is the institution which we, in fact, yesterday when I was in court here, FCT High Court, we were discussing before our case was called often with one from Benin. He said, the Oba of Benin is semi-god. That was what he told me yesterday. It's like he was even footing sand on my face, being from Kano. He said, it's semi-god. No governor can dare do all this, what has been taken can't place also take Kano, away the fact, right Mr. Fage, just one second, Mr. Fage, if you episode. can hear me. We can't also take away the yeah. fact that the governor has the authority to appoint the, the, the traditional rulers, right? So that's why I'm asking the question, because the governor has that authority. He, he also has the, uh, the power to appoint and to maybe remove. Whether or not that is a fact, you may want to speak to that, you know, according to the law. But I'm looking at the political yeah. considerations that make them do the things they do just because they can. Of course, initially, this question was a little bit asked by one of your colleagues here. I answered, of course, he has that power. He has every right to appoint, to dissolve the, but in the course of appointing, the fact that you want to appoint someone, you have, you have to appoint somebody 
that will bring joy and happiness to the people. Because all these governors, our president, all these elected officers, they were elected by the people, by majority of people. So they are expected to be seen doing all what it takes to bring joy and happiness to our people, not otherwise. So when you are making an appointment, let's appoint in that direction. When you are dethroning, let it be dethroned in that direction. But insofar as you cannot do it in that way, you just want maybe bring joy and happiness to one person or two persons, that is not acceptable within the context of our laws and constitution because the entire law, one of the free, uh, philosophers of law, Bentham said, in fact, the whole law, once law is passed or once it's made, which is not bringing joy and happiness to the people, it's not even the law. Okay. So that well, is Mr. Fage, let, let me let me take this to let me take this to Kano now. Um, there, there was an, an, a perspective that we brought in on this something similar to this conversation yesterday, uh, Mr. Osman, where we were asking, how come our colonial masters, the British, the United Kingdom, have a monarchy over their democracy? But in our case, we tend to have our democracy over the monarchy, the monarchical systems that we have grown with over the years, even before we began to have democracy, before we had colonial rule and all of that. How significant is that, such that the politicians, the, the, the democratic authorities now have the power to, as we, for the, in a manner of speaking, uh, destabilize our historical, cultural, and traditional values? In this case, in point, that of uh, traditional rulers. Uh, I, it's very unfortunate, or it's very fortunate, when there was a conquest of uh, different territories that were in existence with their own peculiar systems, traditionally and religiously. Since from there, the issue of constitutional, uh, so our, constitu our traditional institution is not uh, constitutional, I hope you know. And the, the one that operates, let's say like in the uh, UK, is constitutional. And those that have been uh, in existence in most of the Islamic uh, world are constitutional. So, you see, the issue of whether there is a respect or there is otherwise against the traditional institution is the product of constitutional uh, British uh, colonialism. Very unfortunate. They made our system, which was highly respected, but because of uh, first of indirect rule, then uh, the situation uh, had been changed. So it's unavoidable. And yeah. particularly, I have said this, when you are operating constitutional government, where, you, the, where the government is a republic, uh, republican uh, of status, so uh, you, whatever institution you have, it must uh, be in compliance, total, total compliance okay. with All the All right, Mr. Osman. So that is uh, the contention. Uh, interesting, interesting yeah. perspective you bring into the conversation. Let me ask that, uh, the, the same question from, let me ask Mr. Fage the same question this morning. Um, democracy in Nigeria is over our monarchical, cultural monarchical systems. In, uh, in, in the UK, where we were uh, weaned from democratically, or, you know, we have the democracy under their own monarchy. How significant do you see that being in our own context? Do you think we could have or should have done something about it to, uh, I don't know, some kind of homegrown democracy here? Yeah, thank you very much. You see, if you are indeed, as we said, this seat, the seat of our AMS, Obas, and Obis are exalted seat, a revert seat, there is need, of course, constitutionally, for them to have a place in our constitution, our grand norm. Why? Because we cannot be saying we are respecting this office, we are respecting these personalities. All those personalities are worthy of being respected. But in reality, we are just saying it because there is need for an instrument, especially from grand norm, to give that recognition to them so that they will not be subjected to this 
issue of what transferred yesterday and some other years back. So there is a need for them to have a place in our constitution so that they will be highly respected. That's my take on that. All right, let, let me ask uh, Mr. Osmani, man. Uh, Mr. Fager here had said that uh, when the assembly repealed the laws, under what law did they reinstate the former emir? Can you speak to that? Under the 1980, is it 1984 law thereabout, he has mentioned. And now is what we call period of interregnum. Yes. So even if you say the governor cannot formally go and uh, implement the, 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 the substance of the law, but the governor has power to uh, appoint Mr. Sunusi, let's say, or any other person to oversee, to be an overseer of that um, uh, of Kano Emirate. So uh, constitutionally, uh, the governor is uh, well backed to continue with the implement of uh, the, uh, the current uh, law. Okay, that but is my position. Father, you seem to disagree with that. No. Quite all right. You, you, you know, I've been watching your program for years, and I did about two, three interviews with you last year and two years back. You are very sharp, very intelligent. I am not commending you just for the sake of anything, but for what I've been seeing, and it has been attested by so many people. You see, in 2019, when Ganduje administration wanted to amend that law to make the emirate, to, yeah, to make the emirate pipe, beachy and water, as read by my good sister here, they repealed the law. And which law was repealed? That law in 1984, because you have to repeal law. Ab Nisho, we had one. Emir in Kano, as you rightly pointed out. That was one Emir courtesy of 1984 law. And Ganduja now came in 19, oh, 2019 and repealed the law. So that law of 1984 has been repealed by Ganduja. So which law now, as you put him and he said, which law while Ganduja repealed and made po five Emre council in Kano? Then, yeah. in fact, that aside, yesterday, I was reliably informed because in their law, the, in one of the one day first yesterday, they said all the appointment of 2019, 2020, and 2023, all the appointment made by these MS were also annulled, were also abrogated. And one of the kingmakers was appointed in 2022, and he was at the government house yesterday as kingmaker. He was there after being appointed in 2022 by those the throne emirs yesterday, and he was among those that okayed this enthroned emir. You can, as he even put something initially, you cannot put something, let me complete, you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stay. That's the wording of the rebad lord in UAC by Sir McCoy that you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stay. Now you brought someone who has been removed by your law of yesterday, which you assented, and he was among those that orchard yeah. the, this area. Please, we, 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 right. we are in a society which is guided by law. We are not elsewhere. Please. All right, we, uh, I guess a lot of people will be watching to see what happens thereafter. Will the state government proceed today? Or in fact, we will see how they proceed today in light of these laws that are out there. So, gentlemen, Usman Iman, legal practitioner and the lecturer at the Yusuf Metama Studio University, who joined us from our studios in Kano, as well as Adamu Fage here, who is here with us in the studio. Thank you both for coming on today. Thank you Thank very you. much. I'm very, very grateful much. for having me. Thank you very much, viewers. All right, so Business Morning is coming up now with Ini Chomekwa. Thank you so much, Chamberlain. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Business Morning on Channels on Sunrise Daily. And of course, it's on Channels Television. We do have our 30 minutes of business on this side of the studio. We will head back to Sunrise Daily. We start from the global space where oil prices were stable on Friday as investors considered the latest comment 
from the United States Federal Reserve on interest rates and stick inflation, which signs of firming seasonal U.S. fuel demand lent support too. We take a look at the numbers and we see red is the color, but not so red, just very slight. Marginal 0.01% in the red for Brent at $81.38 a barrel. WTI is also uh, red, a bit more red than that. $76.86 uh, for the WTI, both benchmarks are set uh, for a multi month low with Brent crude features closing at their weakest point since January. And then we know some officials there from the US Fed have been saying that they will be willing to hike borrowing costs again if inflation surges. However, Fed Chair Jer 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 Jerome Paul and other policymakers have since said that they feel further rate hikes are uh, unlikely. So we know that uh, uh, the eye is no longer in, on September, which was a likely month for the rate cuts, interest rate cuts, uh, but has moved to November and is even shaking at this time. Meanwhile, strengthening U.S. gasoline demand was helping to stabilize prices ahead of the Memorial Day holiday weekend, which of course begins tomorrow and is considered the start of the U.S. summer driving season, which will do a whole lot of change to the demand for oil. We come to Nigeria and take a look at the dollar. After just about two days of appreciation, it's back to the dropping session. And so we see nothing yesterday was down. So it's down 1.58%. It's opened at 1,462 Naira, 59 cobber, but closed at 1,485 naira, 66 cobber. NAFEX, which is the less active compared to NAFEM, I have 1,478 naira, 80 cobber. That's what it's opening with today after it uh, opened yesterday at 1,458 naira, 4 cobber. That was down. I mean, uh, we see the gap here not so much, 1,442 naira. And this, of course, begs the question, was the appreciation that we saw, I think two days, was it just because of the CBN's intervention last week? Can we continue like this, especially as we celebrate the first anniversary of the president, Bola Tinubu anniversary. It will be time to look at those policies, the merging of the rates market, how efficient has that been? Uh, that and a whole lot more have later on, on Business Morning, subsequently on Business Incorporated later on today. So you don't want to miss any parts of it. Now, the Chief Executive Confidence Index for Manufacturers in Nigeria went up 53.5% in the first quarter of this year, and that's from 518 in the last quarter of 2023. The Manufacturers Association of Nigeria announced this at a meeting in Lagos. The association attributes the slight increase to the anticipation of clearer government policy directions and the marginal appreciation of the Naira in March, which led to lower import costs. According to the president of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, the central bank's persistent rate hikes to combat inflation have not produced positive results, prompting him to make several recommendations. Mike advocate for robust collaboration between monetary and fiscal authorities and suggests considering the following policy measures. Implement targeted interventions aimed at mitigating the underlying cost push factors driving inflation, thereby alleviating the financial burden on manufacturers. Prioritize forex and credit allocation to the manufacturers and fast track the proposed recapitalization of the banking sector. Emphasize the development of infrastructure within industrial hubs and booster nationwide investment in renewable energy sources to alleviate logistic expenses and enhance competitiveness by driving down the energy cost. To further reduce the reliance of the country on imported products and raw materials by providing incentives for investment in backward integration and local sourcing to reduce the pressure or 
So the Rural Electrification Agency has been really busy these days. Uh, yesterday, uh, we did talk about their partnership with NHOSCA that's taking uh, renewable energy to rural areas in the country in partnership with the private sector. Now, uh, in a major move towards universal energy access, REA, that's REA, and the small and medium scale enterprises development agency, SMIDAN, have signed a memorandum of understanding, and this partnership is supposed to provide micro, small, and medium enterprises with reliable and sustainable alternative energy solutions. Country. Uh, the MOU that we are signing is not just a normal MOU as we agreed uh, with you. It's going to be an MOU with a clear implementation framework and that will have clear focus areas. Uh, the first focus area is um, energizing the small and medium enterprises. When we had the initial discussion with you, you uh, one of the challenges you thrown at uh, REA is how do we provide uh, electricity to these small and medium enterprises. We design a program within REE that is uh, called Energizing Economies, mm -hmm. which we want to embed a large chunk of energizing small and medium enterprises in it. The Energizing Economies is a program specifically focusing on energizing markets. And we have done a pilot of markets that we have uh, mentioned, Sabongari, Araria, Shura market. Uh, and we want to scale that up. Uh, we have now done a number of feasibility studies for a number of uh, markets that we want to now start energizing. It is our belief that this project is a bankable project that we don't have to intervene by providing capital subsidy. So there you have it. All of this, of course, will culminate in the assessment of uh, President Bola Tinubu's led administration one year after um, they began work. So we we'll talk a little bit about that. But and uh, one very big factor with this administration is, of course, that pronouncement that President Tinubu made on the day he was inaugurated. Subsidy is gone. And people have said that a lot of the things going on in the country is because of that statement. What if subsidy was not gone from May 29, 2023? How would it have looked like? We have uh, joining us now to help us paint that picture and some others, Mr. Johnson Chuku. He's the chief executive officer and the founder of uh, Kauri Asset Management Limited joins us virtually from Lagos, Mr. Tuku. Thank you so much for your time. So what if the president did not make that statement, subsidy is gone? What do you think would have happened in the country with the economy at this time? Well, Indy, thank you for having me. Um, it would be at the rim of conjecture what could happen, could happen in the economy. But I would try to have a guess on what we would have been dealing with. Um, at the macro level, uh, in terms of inflation rates, we may have had an inflation rate that is below the current 3.69%. 30, uh, 30 Remember that um, as at April last year, inflation rate was 22.22%. 22 That's one factor. Then we may still have been dealing, we may be dealing with a more volatile exchange rate, uh, principally because um, uh, a lot of the uh, imported fuel go to neighboring countries. So the demand on our efforts may be high, may could have been higher than what it is today because when the HGM price of fuel uh, was uh, adjusted upwards from about what it's seven naira to about 560 uh, 528 naira or so or 68 naira uh, the volume of fuel that was being spoken to neighboring countries decreased and therefore had impacted positively on our demand for FX. So we may have had to deal with a, a, a weaker or a more volatile exchange rate. Uh, but for most average Nigerians, what is impacting the most is the inflation rate. Uh, food inflation came at a print of 40.53% in the month of April. So um, if you look at that, probably we would have been dealing with um, a, or a larger depletion in our foreign reserve. Let's put it that way. Because if the government had maintained uh, fixed exchange rates, or what they call then called managed exchange rates, uh, they would have been trying to support the efforts uh, uh, exchange rate, the foreign exchange rate with the reserve. And that thing that would have happened is that the amount of money 
that is going to the three tiers of government wouldn't be what it is today. So the three tiers of government would have been struggling to meet their obligations, particularly salary payment. As you may know, that not many states, um, civil servants are, are now crying off areas of salary payment because the states are getting enhanced uh, allocation. In the first four months of this year, total allocation to the three tiers of government about 4.6 trillion naira. That's the highest in the history of this country. So we may have been dealing with public sector uh, financial difficulties that is impacting on meeting the obligations to the, particularly the public servants. Mm. Uh, and so on the balance, I think um, we would have seen, which I said, you have to hazard a guess on what we will be. We would have seen uh, more established uh, price levels. We would have seen uh, a weaker reserve, and they would have seen a more constrained fiscal space for the federal and state levels, at the federal and state levels. Well, even as we speak, there are conversations that subsidy has been reinstated. I mean, even the IMF has said that subsidy will cost Nigeria about 8.4 trillion naira this year. So, I mean, at this point, there's a lot of uncertainty as to at this subsidy on petrol in this case, it's still existent or is not. Um, well, there's, I think there's actually no debating the fact that that subsidy on petrol exists today, but. Um, the magnitude uh, may not be as it was before the removal of subsidy or before the adjustment. The subsidy that came back to hurt us now is because of the depletion of the local currency or devaluation of the local currency. Uh, clearly, the landing cost of fuel is higher than the pump price. Uh, if you adjust for government intervention, then you could be talking of a pump price that mirrors the price of uh, diesel. You know that diesel is between 1,200 and 1,400 today. And um, if you look at ICE, that is uh, the international price of uh, fuel per metric ton. Um, it's going to be in the region of eight, uh, eight, $750, $800 uh, dollars per metric ton. So if you um, use the, uh, the number of liters in a, in a, a metric ton, about 1164 liters per metric ton, and the compute based on current exchange rate, because exchange rate is a major factor. Uh, in the landing cost of fuel, they exchange it about 1,500 naira. You will be landing, if you factor in all your cost, throughput cost, cost of finance, a payment to NEMASA, payment to NPA, uh, the uh, free charge, you'll be landing the product in the region of 1,000 naira. And then when you uh, add the marketer's uh, profit and their other expenses, you may end up with pump price of more than 1,000 naira. So clearly, there is subsidy on fuel. Because principally because exchange uh, rate depreciated. I did some analysis when the presidency subsidy is gone, and I found out from uh, the NNPC one day they used to arrive at the 568 naira to a liter. They used the exchange rate about 750 naira to the dollar. And um, so if naira had remained at 750 naira to a dollar, maybe uh, even with movement in ice, you could still be buying fuel at maybe 700 naira, 650 uh, or 700 naira. Uh, but today, uh, Asian has moved to about, back to 1,500 naira. And we, if you have to factor in that exchange rate, then you clearly admit that subsidy has crept back into the uh, pricing of refined petroleum, particularly fuel. All right, Mr. Chiku, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we know that this conversation this is the beginning of it, uh, this period, I'm sure the whole of this month. But well, thank you for sharing your thoughts and perspective with us this morning. Thank you for having me. All right, now uh, we're still looking at the economy one year into the president, Bola Tinubu led administration. And we are looking at hospitality and real estate now. Uh, we have a group. Uh, managing director who's overseeing those two areas in his company, Dr. Edward Akinlade. Dr. Akinlade is the group managing director of Holding McCaw PLC. Uh, Dr. Akinlade, thank you so much for your time and good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so how has the uh, President Balatinubu led administration treated you? Uh, you have a company, you're overseeing real estate, you also have hospitality. How has it treated you in the last one year? Um, I would say mixed bag. We have the positive, we have the negative. But let me, let me start on the negative. I think the enabling environment for our industry has been basically squeezed. Uh, our cost is going up. Somebody has to pay for it. And the customer, or we increase uh, the room rates, we increase our prices. 
but it's, it's very, it's, the common man out, out there will suffer uh, from the effect of what we have seen in the last one year. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not I, I will give them probably 30%. Why? That's so low. Yes. Why? Um, the enabling environment should be attracting more uh, inflow into our industry. We can contribute more. Real estate is the driver of many economy worldwide. We have seen what Mrs. Thatcher did in the UK. Now, hotel industry, people will always come for business, especially we are focused more in Lagos. We are seeing increase in uh, occupancy, but our cost is being squeezed. Let me give you one example. One of our hotels in GRA, we recently got uh, a bill from Ikeja Disco. Last month, the bill was 1.5 million. This month is 5.5 million. Who, who pays that? Who does that? So therefore, our room rate has to go up. So our customer will be sweating. Uh, also, it will affect our business. So on that aspect, very tough, very, very tough. On the real estate construction, prices are going up, rents are going up. Why? Cement prices is up, FX is up, because we, most of the thing we use, we have to import it. Inflation is not happening. Interest rates now, close to what? Over to, uh, close to 27, means that we can borrow. If we borrow, the business is non-performing from day one. Interest rates in Nigeria, I believe, should be in single digit. We need to pressurize our bank to move interest rate down. Uh, sorry, probably the CBN. But I know what they will say. It's inflation that is making our interest rate high in Nigeria. But on the positive, I believe this is a short time pain. In the medium, long time, it will be better. Wow, it's good to end on the positive. But I mean, it's uh, this time last year, it's the campaign and the pen and the tension and all of that. Do you think that any other of the front running candidates, you know, that were running for this election, do you think if any of them had gotten into Asorok, that things would have been different? I, I don't want to go there. <laughs> the, 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 prob the public knows my view. But uh, you know I'm on Omeiko. I will always support. Okay. I will always support. So we know where you. Yes, are. I will always support Omeiko. But here's here's the fact. Eight years of Buari scattered it all. It will take time for this government to get to get on with it. One year, maybe too short. If to no, if uh, Atiku or uh, Ubi won, they will still be going through this period. But don't forget one thing: confidence. If the international market have confidence in Nigeria, if we ourselves have confidence in our country, the result will be different because confidence is what will make our exchange rates stabilized. We, uh, the CBN, the Minister of Finance has been trying everything. It's like throwing the bucket at it all. Just keep on throwing, trying everything. But everything is not giving us the results. Why? Why do you think so? Be because of we've confidence. You think, you think we don't have confidence in the administration? No. Or the international... In, in the policy of the CBN... In the policy. ...and the Minister of Finance. We are trying everything. Is it, because, is it because the policies are not right? Or is it perception built over the years? Yes. I think, for me, it is what I would call flip-flop policy. One policy today, on the same matter, you wake up tomorrow, you do another one. For example, look at the BDC situation at the moment. It is not helpful. You cannot tell me I need to come and reapply for my license in the middle of the game. So I have brought all this money into Nigeria to trade in, uh, uh, to, to open a BDC at the airport, and suddenly you're changing the, go the goalposts. No, it's not done. Policy depends on uh, not a, a static position. It must be fixed for a while. When you want to change it, call all the stakeholders, not just they wake up in the morning, boom. A new policy that is what is killing our confidence and until we do that our fx rates is going nowhere mm, that's that's sad but you did say that and, and i've heard this also perhaps it's too early you know to uh judge this administration but at about at what time do you think it should be a fair to give them a fair judgment i will say two years so by this time next, next year, year yes. we should be able to objectively say this administration has done well or not. Yes. Remember, during the days of Buhari, 
Throughout that eight years, all we were hearing is, give us more time, give us more time, give us more time. Unfortunately... And we are afraid that's what we might be hearing here now. No, 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 no. By next year, I will not give them more time. Um, my views are out there. I will not give them more time. Because if by next year, we're not seeing changes. But I know when they will start performing. So let me give you the wisdom today. That's what they're preparing for the second yeah, By By 2026, <laughs> all indices in Nigeria will change. I can assure you that. You it's my prediction. You don't need to be a prophet. Yeah, to, because, <laughs> because who will vote them in after four years? So it's a short time gain. Two years, we will, it will reach us. But going into, by the time we get to 2026, Nigeria will be better. Investors will come. Money will come. Inflation will, will, go, will go, hopefully go down. That, that doesn't sound like a good thing, uh, Dr. Akinlade, because it sounds like something that will be used to entice voters to only vote for a second term. And then after that, things may just get even worse. Yes. Well, it's done worldwide. Every time, any, look, if you see what the conservative government is doing in the UK at the moment, they're bringing rates down, encouraging voters and in one way or the other. But the voters of Nigeria are clever now. They are wiser than what it used to be. You can't use 5,000 or 10,000 to induce voters in Nigeria. Those days are gone. But the reality is this. Eight years of Buhari government damaged Nigeria tremendously. What they were doing at the CBN, unknown to anybody. But it will take the current government time to fix it. It's like a, a, a timbers on top of a timber in the forest. You have to take the first one off. But the one at the bottom are thick. So we're into the thick now. It will be tough. It will be tough. But I can assure Nigerians it will get better. <laughs> Politicians always have a way of, of making, making it better, better as, as we end towards as we the next end election. In the first term. Yes, yes. But when you say it should be better, or you say um, we should give them two years, that is about this time next year, yes. what do you see? What are the indices that will indicate that we are now better? Well, and now we go back. Can we go back to 150 for a dollar or 200? Do you see that? The CBN governor have already given us a target. He said the FX rate should be around 700. So all he's doing at the CBN is working towards that. And like I said, to achieve that is confidence in policy, not flip flop. He will. I, I, what I'm seeing him at the moment doing is settling down. Soon, it will not be bringing on policy, so it will settle. So I can see that happening in that direction. So the FX rate will move back. It is what I would call a butterfly, uh, well, a butterfly exchange rates. It goes up, it goes down, but the long-term trend will be downward. So as we go into 2026, I expect the rates to come down. I'm not saying 700, tough. To achieve that, it needs to bring in probably $50 billion to achieve that. But this I morning... I think $50 billion is not leaked out in the usual holes that are existing in different parts of well, the market. Well, this morning, announcement came that they have been able to raise $20 billion. I don't know where from, but if that comes in, even the, the BDC operators will be laughing all the way to the bank because they know that they have to, whatever they're keeping. Look, FX is in Nigeria. FX is in Dom's account. FX is in our foreign account worldwide. Nobody is bringing it out because of lack of confidence. Once you give me confidence, the money I have in Dubai, in uh, Israel, in uh, London, in US, I will throw it into Nigeria and I will invest. So confident. But like I said, they are working towards that, achieving that goal. Mm. And you think by this time next year, at least, we should be able to give them some part in the back. Call me back this time next year, <laughs> and I will give you what I have seen, why it is getting better. I'm going to put a reminder on my phone. I hope you will answer me when I I will call. do, definitely. Even all if right. I'm in China, I'll be here. Okay, okay. all right. I'll hold you to your word. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Akinlade, thank you so much. Dr. Edward Akinlade, the Group Managing Director of Holding McCall PLC for your assessment. I'll see you this time next year by God's grace. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, so let's uh, look at a bit at uh, market numbers, how it closed yesterday. Well, I can tell you since I was on the stock market report that it was not green, it was red, and, and we lost our 98 
thousand level at ninety seven nine hundred and seventy eight point zero two. It dropped zero point one eight percent and also lost the five hundred that would normally have here. You know, we like the fifty five fifty five. Uh, but that has gone. So it's 55.42 at the close of trade yesterday. Um, profit taking is still the name of the game. Are uh, the NGX as the fixed income? And you know, uh, the fixed income has been. I think there's an auction also today. Yesterday there were the results of the auction with which uh, Anieti Edet talked about during Business Incorporated. I believe he has updates or details of today's auction, or that might come on Monday since it will be at the close of trade. So it seems the fixed income market is actually stealing all of the shine, even the little ones that could have come to the NGX. Uh, look at the numbers there. Treasury bill at the close of trade at the fixed income market yesterday, 219 uh, deals. That was high, you know, worth 229.89 billion naira uh, for the treasury bills the federal government only 10 uh, because those treasury bills that was on i think it's treasury bills also today are uh, 10 deals 7.04 billion for the federal government bonds omo of the central bank hasn't been very active uh it's the treasury bills for now only six deals yesterday. Most of them in the secondary market, you know, not uh, the fresh uh, incoming of uh, securities. But we'll give you more on uh, this. Uh, Anita Edit will be here to give you fresh numbers, intraday numbers, uh, the auction and conversations all around that. And a full package of 55 minutes will be coming your way at 1 p.m. I'll be here also, so you don't want to miss it. Um, in John McQuay, let's head back to the Sunrise Daily Studio. The removal of subsidy on petrol, which for many have thrown up possibilities of inflation, pump price increase and distortion in daily living, is still a talking point within national discourse. <laughs> Touched by those concerns, as we have been told, the president says he will make compressed natural gas CNG the new fuel for mobility in Nigeria. So from power points to possibly action point, the promoters of this gathering want early adopters of the CNG scheme. These people are your hook, and they are the various transport unions, the mechanics, retrofitters, and investors. To catalyze the process, CNG and electric vehicles have been procured by the federal government by the Federal Ministry of Finance and a delivery of 590 buses is expected in the first phase of the program over the next few months. It is divided into 520 dual CNG and petrol buses and 65 EV buses. We are mobilizing the private sector, development funders, ECOWAS Bank of Industry and Development, Development Bank of Nigeria, Bank of Industry, even commercial banks are on, on queue and waiting and willing to finance this effort. And we'll be rolling this out for the benefit of the sector. CNG buses will be deployed to 23 states where there is CNG, while electric vehicle buses will be delivered to states where CNG is not currently available. This is what fit kits. Clarifications were also sought concerning safety, CNG refilling stations, conversion of PMS vehicles, standards, and training. Every cylinder would have its own unique identification number that you tie to the car. Any car that is getting converted, your conversion cylinder, the car registration number, even your license plate, everything will be linked to it. So you can just see a cylinder number and straight away you know that it's for this car. Nigeria generates an estimated 36,000 tons waste annually. 10,000 vehicles are required daily to convey them. CNG, we are told, will reduce the cost of this mobility by half. If we know what we are reducing, we know the quantity of fuel, we are consuming before the CNG, you can calculate this, we can get carbon credit, which you can use to leverage the investment we are looking for towards this area. Nigeria has CNG in abundance, and we are here to use it appropriately. We also have uh, LPG from the liquefied petroleum, from the petroleum mining. That one has a lot of, there is a lot of international control on that, on pricing. CNG, we can locally control the pricing. If over 10 million vehicles in Nigeria sign on, granted all the parameters are in place, Nigeria may well be headed faster into its decade of gas aspirations.
Ulu Phillips, Channel Television News. To be or not to be? Well, I think the not to be part should just be eradicated altogether. To be, most certainly. I guess the rest of the story is how. Joining us this morning to discuss this is Shegun Akabashoro, who is uh, the chairman and chief promoter of Zeta Power Limited. He's with us right here in the studio. Thanks for joining us. This Thank you for having me. Good morning. Well, perhaps there is some, a need for some kinds of clarifications about CNG. Well, the attempt there by the two gentlemen who spoke last tend to kind of give some inkling. First, the fact that we can control, locally control the price of CNG and all of that. Do you want to give us a quick background on that? First of all? Yes, absolutely. Because um, compressed natural gas is something we have in abundance. And over the decades, we've been flaring it away. I mean, this is, that is burning it away because we are not actually harnessed it for, for use. We have not harnessed them for use. So eventually, we are being forced at this point in time that um, the price of petrol or we should like to say liquid fuel, that is petrol and diesel, is not sustainable. It's um, so volatile and it's becoming ab uh, above the means of the average Nigerians. And not just the average Nigerians, the, the cost of production for manufacturers, everything that is being done is energy. Uh, so there has to be a turning point where we have to look for cheaper, better, and re reliable source of energy because <clears throat> For humanity, from all time in memorial, our sustainability as a species and our advancement has been based on how we get energy, especially energy that is cheaper and better for the environment, better for us and the environment at large. So eventually, we've been moving from stages from coal to this fossil fuel, and now we're talking about CNG, which is... Uh, uh, more of gas, not a liquid fuel, it's gas, and it's cleaner, it's better for the combustion, uh, it's friendlier to the environment and eventually to us. And uh, fortunately for us in this part of the world, in Nigeria, we have it in abundance. We are one of the largest depository in the world, and of course the largest in Africa. Yeah. And uh, so we, 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 we have no choice at this point but to move to better energy. And if you see the initiative of the president, I think it's a wonderful initiative. It is, I mean, we are at the catch-22 that we must transit because the cost, the, 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 the issue of the dollar, that so, so many Naira is chasing the dollar, and importation of fuel, refined fuel, is one of the major issues. Mm -hmm. And so this is a situation where we don't have to have refined product, like one of your I think it was Okbefa that was referring to that, that is locally produced. Yes. So you don't have to have a foreign exchange in that aspect to buy or to sustain the availability of such a um, fuel. Well, at least uh, one fact is known to us, even though, as you said earlier, before we came on, uh, the idea of CNG has been on since the 1800s. Yes. Uh, well, Nigeria's um, knowledge of it also dates back into the 70s and 80s. But initiatives of government didn't start until the early 2000s. And even then, not much has really been, been done, except for the recent developments since actually 2020 in the wake of COVID when the government was, uh, you know, had begun to talk about some things. But the challenges that, uh, pre, that, that could prevent it are unlimited. Infrastructure deficiency, high cost, uh, public awareness, is one of those uh, issues, policy and regulatory issues, safety concerns, and all of those things. Which challenge would you say takes the cake that needs to be addressed seriously and holistically before this thing can really get off the ground in Nigeria? Well, I would love to, I would have preferred to say all of the above that you mentioned is actually, I mean, they are all in one. Mm. Uh, but the most daunting of all those challenges you highlighted is the Finance, mm. um, because to have the infrastructure on ground, it's going to cost. That's the initial investment that actually we need to overcome starting it because it's quite expensive. Uh, ordinarily, um, gas value chain is far more expensive than what you have with liquid fuel like petrol and diesel. 
um, the infrastructure you have to put on ground is, is no man's uh, play. I mean, you're looking at to have just two nozzle dispensers, it's going to cost you almost half a million dollars to have them on ground because you have to first secure a production that this is what you need, have it brought to Nigeria, installed, then you need the overhead storage system, the tanks, the gasket tanks, that now supplies compressors. So all of those things takes time and it's quite expensive to bring them in and install. But it's not, it's something that can be done. It can be overcome. Yeah. And I've always said that it's, we, we are at a point where we need this transition. Yeah. It is better, it is reliable, and it is cheaper. What will it take? Better for the economy. What will it take and how long will it take for Nigeria to get to at least some fairly safe um, space in the concerning Ex Exactly. Area. So we're saying that out of the pool of 100% of where we are today, yeah. that we're going to take a chunk, maybe 25% transition over a period of time. Now, it has to be well planned. And I think the, um, the members of uh, initiative and also the government policymakers have taken this into consideration. However, what I would suggest is that there is what you call the low hanging fruit, the things we can do immediately that would not take so much time because in order for you to have all of those petrol dispensing stations, like the government said that you should must have, they want every petrol station to have a dispensing station for gas. It's quite expensive and they will need financing and then that may not come immediately. So, so as you are now converting vehicles, mm. the rate at which your conversion is going on, you must also have availability of stations for them to go and refill their tanks or else they lose confidence in the availability. So those things have to move simultaneously together. So you said 25% over how many years? Maybe over the next three years. I mean, it's not something we need to really take so much as the average transport vehicle. That's why I want to bring this uh, into, into cognizance. You see, the cost of production for manufacturers, transportation of goods, I think those are the areas of low hanging fruits, generating sets, combustion of heavy diesel engine that powers companies, institutions, every area of production. These are areas where these are the low hanging fruits that can be done. Those conversions can immediately be done mm. because they are not dependent, <clears throat> excuse me, on other scenarios. That is, if you're going to have gas, that vehicles are going to, let's say I'm converting 5,000 vehicles in Lagos for gas. Mm. They have to be a radius of which where they have to travel to refill their petrol tanks. And they have to have articulated vehicles to bring this gas from the mother tank all the way to the petrol station mm. regularly. So all of these things takes timing. And now for the investor, who is not going to say, I'm going to invest money, I'm going to borrow money to build this infrastructure so that vehicles can come to my station and buy petrol. They will have to have a guarantee of vehicles that would buy their products. Mm. They have to have a, a, a minimum number of liters that they will have to sell a day in order to make their returns on their investment. Mm. So, so, so these are what the fears of the average investors are. Well, the, mm. average, the fears of the average investor is one. Mm. The fears of the people is another. The safety concerns are humongous, particularly in the light of the recent occurrence, I'm sure you're aware of it, where some CNG vehicles exploded for one reason or the other. And as far as people are concerned, it is a CNG vehicle that exploded, irrespective of what the circumstances are. How can you allay these fears? I can tell you for free that CNG vehicles are actually very safe. I mean, we have explosions with petrol vehicle cars, and they have reasons. So the reports need to come out to tell us exactly what transpired. It's not to do with the eating system, not to know. These gas tanks are well constructed to take pressures of, over, of about 300 bars, which is the measurement of pressure. And you don't feel it for, when you fill these tanks, you don't do more than 250 bars of pressure. So it's quite safe. And they have safety mechanisms on them to make sure that such things do not occur. So for any reason that a CNG vehicle exploded, I mean, I'm not sure if that is called an explosion or it caught fire or there is a mar So we need um, a, a report on exactly what happened. But in CNG in Nigeria, CNG has been used, it's being used in Europe, I mean, in Spain, Italy, they are using it. They have a sizable number, even in India and Brazil, they have a sizable number of cars that have been on CNG for years. 
and there has not been one incident of explosion. So if we take the Nigerian factor and put it into it, maybe that is what had occurred. But I want to dissuade that fear that that is much, that's actually untrue, that CNG vehicles are prone to explosion. No, they are not. It has never occurred anywhere outside of Nigeria. So what occurred in Nigeria needs to be investigated and put in line with exactly what happened. What do you think occurred? I, I, I think there's a factor that people, I mean, that's why you need technician. That's why I listened to one of the, I think it was Mr. Uhuru, who was talking about the safety issues, that we have to have regulations. Who installs these things? They have to be satisfied. What kind of equipment, standardized equipment, are they using? It has to be standardized. So the regulation is important. So there's training and certification for vehicle owners to say that, yes, it is certified that regulated people installed, regulated products were also installed, and within a time frame that is required, that you must take your vehicle back for recertification within a period of time. There's a period for those time to assuage those possibilities of incidents that will occur on CNG vehicles. Mm -hmm. So that is why we need the regulatory body to call, come together. And like he was saying that once you have your tank fitted, your vehicle registration, the, the, the owner of the vehicle, they, they, will be, they will be in touch with you to make sure that there is no excuse for you to go beyond the time frame for a certification. And in getting the certification, they will check the tanks, checks all of the needed requirements. So this has been working seamlessly all over the world many parts of the world, never with this kind of incident. So we have to be very careful with the Nigerian factor and the switch that this has not occurred anywhere else like that. So okay. it's, I, I, I'm, it's, it's pretty... Oh, are, are you satisfied <clears throat> with the regulations that government put in? Yes, I've been... We've had a series of meetings. I mean, I've been privileged to be in one of such meetings. And Ulua Gwemi, who is the chairman of the PSCNG initiative, um, they've been really trying to get everybody on ground to have that regulation in place. I mean, I think they had promised sometime in um, April or March that we will have a comprehensive regulatory system in which makes sure that the training, the kind of equipment they're going to use, the standardization, is all going to be comprehensive. And they've been bringing everybody, all stakeholders on board. Like, let's discuss this so that we can cross the T's and the dots to make sure that there's no lapses. Because one incident or one bad incident is enough, like you, like you just suggested, that an explosion of a CNG vehicle gives its bad, it's a bad taste, very, very bad taste. And it, 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 it gives people the impression that it's not safe. Mm -hmm. And actually it is safe, it's just that we need to follow the regulatory procedure of how these things is being done successfully elsewhere. What kinds of um, government infrastructure are you looking at, for instance, um... I'm talking about soft infrastructure. The federal government has, you know, this initiative out and some kind of policy and the steering committee is working on it, just as you have mentioned. But then what role do you think states have to ensure that these things are... A huge role. With? A huge role. You see, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so happy when the federal government came out with this policy that they want all MDAs to have combustion processes for their vehicles and also to think futuristically that the future cars you're going to be um, 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 secure acquiring will be CNG vehicles. It's a wonderful initiative. Now, being a federal government initiative, it behoves on them to be the test pilot for the citizenry and the general public, because this is a federal government initiative. So federal government itself should say, listen, we are initiating this program and we have tested as pilot for others to come and join in. Come and have a look at what we are doing. Some of our vehicles, let's say a sizable percentage, we take the pool of the ministries, vehicles of all these MDAs, and you say, let's say by the end of this year, let's have 20%. 20% of those vehicles converted. Or your utility vehicles, your ELOXs, your construction vehicles, let's have all of them converted. So government, I mean, including state governments, will take up that initiative and tell their ministries that, listen, in each of these ministries, I need 10, 10% 10 of your vehicles converted. So it's a test pilot. We can now tell the public that we have tried this. It's been certification, regulation, everything works because it's within a limited group of people that is government agencies. We will now 
the success of that will now push them to invite private sectors, the institution, the banks, the industries, the insurance, all of these people that listen, come in. You need to buy into this. We have done this. We have a conversion center. We have a dispensing station. We've been dispensing this for the past year or six months. No incident. It is safe and it is good for our vehicle. These are the savings on returns on our investment that we have seen that government can now show case like a, a public clinic and invite everybody and say, this is how it is done. So you can take from us and start getting the private industries or private people involved in this process. So it's a wonderful ideology. I mean, idea from government to say, let us start with ourselves as examples, as a test pilot that people are always apprehensive that is this going to work? Does this make sense? Is this profitable? Is this going to be uh, 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 a better thing for Nigeria. It is a wonderful idea. It's actually going to take Nigeria to the next level, mm. to the real next level. It's a revolution, and okay. we need to do that. You know, um, some people will be wondering, every time we've talk, spoken about CNG, we've only largely spoken about vehicles, spoken about cars, spoken exactly. about trucks and all of that. And maybe in some little instances talked about uh, manufacturers and all of those things. Is that all that CNGs are useful for? No, CNG, you see, funny enough, CNG, we've been using about maybe 1% of the capacity we have in Nigeria that certain industries, petrochemicals have been using. Even the Jenkos fire their turbines with these gases. So there's limited use of it. It's available and people are using it. Like for instance, our company have been installing, converting heavy duty generators to gas for a long time, for the past, almost 14 years now, where there are many industries, we've done it. So it works. So mm -hmm. they are generating sets, companies, and this I said, these are the low hanging fruits, mm -hmm. companies, because the cost of operation, you find out, oh, businesses are folding up and all these other reasons, is because the cost of energy is so high. Okay. And that is what any Western or developed countries always go after, cheaper, better, reliable energy, because it's the driving force of advancement and development. I was actually wondering whether or not it's going to be useful for domestic use as well. Don't, oh, answer, oh, don't answer that one yet. Yes, <laughs> Chamberlain you. wants to ask you a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Chamberlain. And good to see you again. Well, actually, you know, the thing about the CNG is that we, people need to just go be sure, check the safety measures, and show that you put certain things in place because they have actually, or there are cases, if you just check, you see, uh, one of the most recent one was in uh, Los Angeles, where uh, there was a tank. Uh, it was it exploded, actually. It was exposed to fire. And the tank was, because it was pressurized, so I think they said it was about 3,000 PSI. So there are different circumstances under which that explosion can happen. So people need to just keep checking to be sure they don't take things for granted. So uh, let me ask you, you talk about government leading by example. And so talk to us about some of the policies that they've announced, for instance, I know the president did announce that, look, vehicles from the government, MDAs, you have to go CNG. So those kinds of announcements and those kind of policies, how significant are they? Because you also have complained about how they need to make sure those policies actually achieve to ensure that CNG is here for good. I mean, first and foremost, um, I think the explosion you are discussing or you narrated was an LPG, liquefied propane or butane gas that exploded. Well, that wasn't CNG. No, um, no, CNG is CNG. gas and the other no, no, it, LPG, it is CNG. butane, it, it, it is. I mean, that's confirmed. Well, I would have to... Um, yeah, um, it's CNG. I will read Just check it, you'll see it. However, yeah. um, with the policy of government, I, I support it completely. And I think it is high time that we have to go this route in which if there is no push, uh, we are going to be talking about CNG forever. And, you know, uh, the government itself has a need to, to have a paradigm shift in the way things are done, especially, like I've said, many Western and developed nations all over the world have gone out of their way to seek for energy. The exploration we have in Nigeria, oil and gas, are mostly from multinationals that are foreign. And so this is, they don't take, they don't, it's a very, very important aspect of governance in order which helps your standard of living. So the cheaper your energy, 
either for the individual or the company, matters a lot. So what government has done is telling Nigerians that we have to start a system by which we have to have cheaper, better, and reliable energy in this country, especially when we have it in abundance. And there's no excuse that we should not jump on this immediately. So it makes a lot of sense, like I said earlier, that the government agencies should be a test pilot for the rest of the nation, for the rest of the country and the community of countries in Nigeria, that this has to work. We have started that example and it can work. So a test pilot in any, um, in any uh, innovative uh, initiation is a proof of concept that this concept works. So government is rightly saying this is the best, the right thing to do that we have to be the example for the nation. It is possible, it can be done, but it just has to be detailed and planned and uh, 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 clear to all. Because investors need to know that the government are serious about that. That's where the lukewarm attitude and uh, 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 invest, investors are always afraid of that. Is this just a government policy? Is this just something that uh, we're just going to one step forward and two steps back? But when government itself takes that steps, then they are convinced that this is not only the thinking of government, this is the future of what this government wants. Uh, just so we can, you know, talk a little bit more about its rollout in itself. I mean, there's a lot that's been said about CNG. Cheaper, safer, better, needs more heat to combust. Even with all of these, these incidents around the world, there's a lot of write-up about how much safer it is. You know, your petrol car would also uh, explode in, in that sort of high tension uh, situation, but it would take longer if you have CNG. We've seen all of these research, but I want to talk about the benefits to the Nigerian people. So uh, we're talking about $18.3 billion annually. Uh, and of course, uh, man hours, 266 million man hours if we're able to do this rollout. What do you think is the holdup? Why do you think this hasn't been done all this while? And in what ways can we hasten it? Because, you know, the, the education is here now. And with everything going on, everyone, at least everyone that I know, is thinking about trying to, you know, let's explore cheaper energy. Let's try, see if we can use it even for domestic use. Are there uh, conversations in that direction? And when do you, you know, when would you hope that the actual rollout, especially in places like Lagos, Port Harcourt, and Abuja, would happen in full, in, in full, so we can reap the benefits of this energy. Thank you very much. I mean, on the average, I can just tell you off the board that the cost of what you're spending now, if you convert to CNG, from 100%, you'll be saving 60 to 70% of your daily cost on the average liter of petrol. So if you're buying petrol at 620 Naira, or let's say roughly 600 Naira, and you're buying CNG equivalent of the same liter at 200 Naira, you are saving 400 Naira on every liter you are buying or using. So the more you use, the more, the bigger your savings. So the return on your savings is humongous. It's the initial investment that requires government intervention. And... I mean, availability of financing, especially the, the single digit um, 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 rates of, um, um, of, of repayment. So it's for the Nigerian, for the average Nigerian, this is a win-win. We have to go through the process of what you call the, um, the aching or the arching process in which eventually when this becomes, becomes, I mean, the savings is humongous. I mean, for the average Nigerian who is going to work, who is using his, uh, 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 cooking gas because CNG is also can be used as a cooking gas. We've not talked about that. How much will I save? Oh, you are saving 60, 70 percent easily, averagely. So you are, if you are buying a tank of 12 kg at 200 naira per kg, you are spending 2,400 naira to fill your 12 kg tank. As Imagine that, as opposed to a thousand or more, a thousand. 1,100 naira Can I get it now? <laughs> where, where you're trying to convert. I like the enthusiasm. And this is where, this is where the low-hanging fruits, I mean, real estates, new estates, whatever that are coming up, these are things that they can uh, uh, put into their structures, not only for the cooking gas, for their generating sets. So they are now saving money. And you have, oh, you you have money. more money in your pocket. So, least, so as manufacturers... You, as you said, the, the initial cost is humongous. It is. It is. And this is where government intervention needs to come in. That, listen, 
central bank need to sit down with financial institutions that are bringing and say, listen, how do we give these people single digit rates mm. and a longer term? Okay. Well, I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a continuation of the conversation. The awareness has to increase and so that people can be able to themselves embrace it. And not just in urban Nigeria, but even in rural areas oh, yes. as well, because it's a lot cheaper, as you have yes. said. We have to thank you this morning, you, Mr. Thank Sheikh Mwakabasho, Chairman and Chief Promoter, Zeta Power Limited. Thank you so much for your thank time you for having for me. this morning. Thank you. Well, I don't know, Chamberlain, if we have any any message from anywhere about this, Chamberlain and Kayla? No. Mm. Uh, uh, I think no, we're just chill. We're, we've been, we've not, uh, we don't have those messages for you right now. But you know, you see the CNG matter. If we can get women, especially those of us who need gas, uh, if we can get the refilling stations out there and get us to, to be more, you know, to understand how much this is going to save. Just listening to how much it will save me on cooking gas. Forget about my car. Cooking gas. If we can, if we can get it and get the stations where this can be refilled, I can tell you that this will be unbundled faster. Well, I, you heard, only women need gas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there you go. That wraps the show up today. <laughs> well, thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. I'm Chamberlain Lusso. Goodbye. I'm Kayla Magwa. Well, have a great week in the head. And Liz is not the one that we breathe with. Have a wonderful rest of, it, of your day. I'm Ayo Makinde.